Fantasy Edge with Jonathan Chan, Kevin Quo, Richard Seville. Hello and welcome to the Fantasy Edge. I am Richard Seville, FantasySixPack.net, and joining me shortly, Kevin Huo and Jonathan Chan, also of FantasySixPack.net. We are finished week one, and uh, there's only just the two Monday Night Air games to uh, to close it out. But uh, it, in progress, it seems that the Steelers are leading 16 to 10 against the Giants. And it looks like uh, Benny Snell is taking over the backfield as uh, James Connor is out with a sprain. So, um, Jono and Kev, Jack, Jono, how are you today? I'm doing pretty well, Richard. How's it going? No, uh, not too bad. Not a bad weekend, all told. Still waiting for some results. Uh, Kev, how was your weekend, and is it over yet? Football is back, so I'm good. To, I mean, I'm as happy as could be, and. Uh... Yeah, it's pretty much over. None of these two games are going to matter much for me. Right. Um, just to get a little bit of the news before we get into our uh, into our main program today, we're going to be looking at uh, uh, what we learned, our moving on up segment, uh, our panic button. We're going to have our Mr. Unlimited of the week. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the waiver wire, players we can drop, and any, any spec ads that if you uh, didn't get the guys that you want on waivers, guys that work kind of keeping uh, uh, past the curve on the on our radar. So spec ads is uh, one of our favorite, uh, at least one of my favorite segments. Anyways, let's get into the news. Uh, Marlon Mack, uh, torn Achilles out for the season. Um, kind of um, a, a bit of a boost for Jonathan Taylor people, but also uh, Naheem Hines is... Uh, uh, one of the uh, top waiver pickups this week, uh, John O. Marlon Mack. Do you think? Uh, do you think uh, we're going to see? Uh, is does that put uh, Jonathan Taylor into uh, high RB one territory? Uh, it definitely puts him in RB one territory. I don't know if I would put him high up there just yet, just because he struggled a little bit with his uh, efficiency on the ground. But uh, Rivers was Rivers. He peppered his running backs. I think. Uh, Taylor, Mack, and Hines combined uh, before Mack got hurt, combined for 44% of Rivers' targets, so both Taylor and Hines are going to get a ton of work uh, in the passing game, and that will definitely boost Taylor's floor. RB1 territory, I wouldn't put him high yet until the efficiency uh, comes through. Kev, is the waiver hype for uh, Naheem Hines, is that uh, valid? I think it is. Uh, I think um, it's it's easy to think of the Colts offense as more of a Phil- Philip Rivers offense as they've kind of just done everything that he's always done. So um, we saw last year that he targets his run. I mean, we all know Philip Rivers targets his running backs a lot. Uh, and Naheem Hines is going to fill that kind of Eckler role to Jonathan Taylor's Melvin Gordon role. So Hines is definitely worth a pickup. I doubt you'll ex- he'll be the touchdown scorer, but he's going to be fine. Um, and this is kind of topical for you, Kev. Uh, Michael Thomas, high ankle sprain. Now, you were offered a trade. Uh, we were talking uh, a little bit earlier in our F6P chat room uh, about about this trade. Uh, Michael Thomas and Lamar Jackson for... Um, and then you get DK Metcalf and... Uh, pardon me. Yeah, yeah, you get DK Metcalf and Lamar Jackson. And you give uh, Deshaun Watson and Michael Thomas. But apparently the guy is reneging on the deal or something like that. What's going on? <laughs> no, he's just, uh, we're, we're just talking it out. But yeah, the trade would be, um, I'd give Deshaun, get Lamar. I'd give Michael Thomas and get DK. And the only reason I'm considering it is because I'm very worried about the high ankle sprain. Um, that's typically an injury that lingers and, you know, we never really know how it's going to go. Um, and obviously the the upgrade from Deshaun to Lamar is actually pretty huge if you think about it so i don't know i'll think about it we'll see how it goes mm. john is this uh high uncle sprain if it does linger <clears throat> um who's next up it would it be emmanuel sanders then uh, i guess it would be sanders as the next like the de facto first receiver there uh a nice i guess before the spec ads my spec ad before spec ad would be traquan smith uh he's been there for a while drew Brees knows him and it, it could work out if uh if sent if Sanders can't handle the number one duties all by himself. And uh, sticking with you, Le'Veon Bell, uh, not a very good day yesterday. Um, hamstring strain. Um, are we uh, rushing out to get Josh Adams? I'm rushing out to get Frank Gore, honestly. Uh, 
Gase loves that guy for whatever reason. I mean, Gore's a legend, obviously, but uh, Gore was was the the lead back after Bell went out. So I would get Gore before Josh Adams. Kev, do you agree? I'm not wasting my time with either of them. If I <laughs> if I lose my fantasy season because I didn't pick up Frank Gore, so be it. I, I'm not doing it. <laughs> <laughs> but no, but is is this Lev Bell? Is it is it, isn't it kind of a laughable? Um, it's it's fantasy laughable because we were down on Lev Bell all season, and then but and and true to form, Lev Bell lets everybody down, and it, it just seems to me like you're right. This this is a backfield you really want to stay away from because the Jets. They're just the Jets with Adam Gase, and I don't know why. You know, it's just too awful to contemplate. They are not a fantasy-friendly team. I mean, okay, Jameson Crowder, yes, he he looked good. He got a lot of targets, and I think he's about the only one that you can really, uh, quote-unquote, trust. But uh, apart from that, um, I really, the Jets are, uh, it's tough sledding if you're, if you're going with the Jets. Um, John O., um, moving on to Miles Sanders. Now, this news came up a little bit late, and some some kind of suspect that that the that the Eagles knew about this uh, when they were doing their cuts of the fifty three that Miles Sanders wasn't gonna wasn't gonna play. Um, what's the status of Miles Sanders, and 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 what what's happening there? Uh, well, Sanders sat out Sunday's game with a hamstring injury. Uh, but I don't think it's the Eagles have said it's not too serious. Uh, they've already said that there's a good chance that. Both Sanders and uh, offensive lineman Lane Johnson are going to play next week. Uh, so that's good news considering they lost to the Washington football team. Uh, I have also seen theories on Twitter that Sanders was purposely sat down because they thought that the Washington game would be easy, which in hindsight is pretty funny. But uh, you can't really rely on any of that. It's just fun to think about. But yeah, Sanders, uh, if I'm the Eagles, I don't, I'm not playing until he's 100%. So I think they made the right decision either way, uh, especially something like a hamstring soft, soft tissue injury could linger. And uh, for somebody that relies on speed and athleticism, it, uh, 100% is definitely the way to go. Right. Uh Kev, uh, do you think uh, this this backfield is going to turn into a, a committee as as always as it's always been now because of how because they probably want to preserve Sanders now a little bit? Yeah, I, I kind of agree with Jonathan. I kind of just think that they'll just hold Sanders out until he gets healthy. Um, they can't really afford to have any more injuries on this team. So, and then once he gets back, I like the I, Boston Scott did not impress, no. and Corey Clement is Corey Clement. So. Whenever Sanders gets back, it's still his backfield. I'm not. I'm not wavering from that. Right. And just moving on to Blake Jarwin, torn ACL. <laughs> is is he out? I, I haven't heard the. Uh, yep. Out yep. for the season. Done for the season. Done for the season. So the so who's the uh, who's next up? Dalton Schultz. Hmm. Dalton Schultz. Never heard of him. That is that the name correct, is new yeah, to me. The correct answer is C.D. Lamb is next up. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's the fantasy answer. That's yeah. that's the real one. Right. Um, James Robinson, um, a surprise. Uh, didn't score, but um, looked solid and uh, very like comfortable in the uh, Leonard Fournette role. Um, He's obviously uh, a waiver pickup that people are looking to uh, looking to get. Do you think he continues as the bell cow here, uh, Kev? I mean, I think I, there's no other option. It's uh, Chris Thompson, who's just a passing catching pass catching guy, and then uh, Dazine Ogzibo, who's now on IR. So, well, I mean, when Raquel uh, gets back from the COVID. Oh, that's uh, that's a little harder to guess, but I would say that that James Robinson has probably done enough to keep it. I mean, the problem with Raquel is. When he's out with COVID, he's missed so much time that uh, it's just he's going to be behind in, the, in a new offense. He's going to be behind as far as pretty much everything. And I just got to assume that James Robinson hasn't done enough to lose his job, I guess. Well, he hasn't even. Yeah, he, um, um, it's a it's a good start for James Robinson, right? Uh, Jono, is, uh, is he a worthwhile uh, pickup? Yeah, I mean, he should have been owned in most leagues either way, unless it's super shallow. But like Kevin said, he's the only running option there. And Jacksonville knew that because they gave him 100% of the running back carries. Uh, Thompson had, I think, two receptions for four yards, something under 10 yards, I think. And um, Robinson looked good. He like he has vision. He's got speed. He actually, and the Jags O-line looked surprisingly good against uh, what's supposed to be a pretty good Colts front seven. So I was uh, very pleasantly surprised with Robinson, and he's definitely needs to be added everywhere after this week. Right. 
Um, just one more thing about, uh, now, Jacksonville won the game. Now, aren't they supposed to be, <laughs> I mean, isn't it kind of the idea for them? I mean, they're kind of doing every move possible to try and, uh, you know, they look like draft chasers, right, this year. They look like the draft yeah. chaser team. So they go out and they win the game. Um, you can't tank You can't tank when you have Minshew on your team. The guy's just too good. Yeah, no, I guess not. Uh, John, oh, um, I mean, um, why aren't they... Uh, I mean, they didn't do a very good uh, tank job. It's too difficult to tank in the NFL. There are 53 people fighting for their jobs and their livelihoods every week, and you can't tell them, oh, play bad, because then you could, they could never play again. Like, it's impossible almost to tank in the NFL, especially with a quarterback as, you know, as actually good as, uh, as Gardner Minshew is. He is good. He is good. 19 for 20. Nobody saw that coming. No. Except for Minshew. Yeah, no, no. And that's, uh, that's actually a good thing to happen if you're in the, uh, in the Scott Fishbowl. Because uh, you lose a point for every incomplete. Did you know that? Yes. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, Sam Darnold still scored positive points, so it's not like <laughs> bad. <laughs> Sam Darnold still managed positive points this week, mm-hmm. so there, there, are, there are worse, uh, worse scoring options for QBs. All right, let's get into our uh, our discussions uh, now. Um, what did you learn, Kev? What did you learn about this weekend that uh, that um, that opened your eyes a little bit to something that we should know? Um, probably the biggest thing I learned is that Josh Jacobs is going to be the guy, like the guy. Uh, I had concerns about him because it seemed like they were bringing guys in to take the pass catching work away from him. Uh, like they brought in Theo Riddick, they brought in Devontae Booker, but he actually ended up with the second most receiving yards and receptions and targets on his team. In addition to, you know, all the work that he did on the ground. So that really really if i had known that before the season josh jacobs would have been a like an easy top eight rb for me so that that's probably my biggest takeaway mm. uh john what did you observe <laughs> this weekend that uh, sparked your attention uh it's the biggest thing would have been and kevin knows this already we discussed this at length but the hype on clyde edwards hilaire is absolutely real um he was excellent in his nfl debut uh, a lot of people talked about you know the kc offense being catalyst uh he couldn't punch in the goal line carries but the point is not that, you know, he couldn't bust a one yarder up the middle when the Texans sold out. The point is that Andy Reid gave him six carries inside the five yard line. And at some point they're going to scheme him actual plays to get him in there. Uh, and the fun thing is that his yards after contact were so good that even if you take away all the yards before contact, he still would have been this week's leading rusher. So yeah, top five running back. Easy. Clyde Everett Hilaire. Um, the one there, I, there were a, a lot of takeaways that, I mean, we could discuss, uh, uh, Sunday to until the next Sunday. Um, uh, but the one thing that I noticed in the Sunday night game is the, uh, Rams backfield is, um, it's, it looks as though the, uh, the bell cow is going to be Malcolm Brown. You can almost count on him being the, the guy at the goal, getting the goal line carries. You're going to, um, Cam Akers is going to be the guy between the 20s. And um, as for Daryl Henderson, once he gets healthy, I think he'll mix in a little bit. It won't help Malcolm Brown, but I think Malcolm Brown's still going to be the guy down the uh, uh, down at the goal line. Um, one thing that I noticed that the, the Rams offense is very, very... And, and they mentioned this, uh, I think Collinsworth mentioned this too, and, and I took notice when, after he mentioned it. And it's they're very they run very few plays, but they work on them to death to try and get them perfectly right. Because uh, so the, their their idea is keep the offense simple, but everything that they do is uh, work is to try to work everything to perfection. And um, it came off. Oh, by the way, speaking of that, um, what you guys think of the Gallup call? Soft. You know? Yeah. It wasn't, That's all I got. Uh, yeah. Not my favorite call. Yeah, I was just uh, to have that decide the game when, uh, yeah, I get it. He extended his arms a little bit, but the refs, I mean, the, the pe- I was going to say people didn't come to see the refs, but nobody showed up to the game. Uh, people aren't tuning in to see the refs. Uh, just let them play. Yeah. I mean, if this was last year, then, you know, the call would have been challenged and then nothing would have happened. So at least we didn't waste time on that. That's true. That's true. Um, moving on up. It's time for moving on up. Um, uh, Kevin, you haven't got anything on the board, but I'm sure you have somebody who's moving on up. Well, I'll start with you. It's not on the board, but but I, surprise us with who your moving on up guy is. Who's moving on up this week for you? And um, don't pick what we've picked. Pick. <laughs> I'll go with the homer pick. Moving on up for me would be J.K. Dobbins. Uh, I really just didn't. 
I mean, it's still someone we I kind of have to we still have to look at because this game wasn't exactly a close game. But I definitely didn't expect him to get as much work and definitely not as much red zone work as he did. Um, and he thoroughly outplayed Mark Ingram, who just had a horrible game. Uh, Ten carries for twenty nine yards for Ingram. So Dobbins is someone. I mean, he looks good. Uh, he's definitely dynamic. If Mark Ingram is slowing down a bit at all, like I thought it'd be 70-30 Mark Ingram and the other backs this year. But if it's going to be closer to 60-40 or 50-50, then Dobbins is going to be like a flex starter every week. Mm. I uh, Yeah, I agree. Uh, Mark Ingram uh, uh, was the... I rank him as the worst uh, RB based on what he was uh, projected and for what his actual rank was. He ranked 57th among running backs, and he was projected as 18th. Ouch. Um, Joe Mixon wasn't that great. Nick Chubb, not a great day. We could we could talk about him perhaps later. And, of course, we talked about Le'Veon Bell and Austin Eckler um, are your five backs that just did not live up. Um, Jono, you're up. Moving on up. Uh, moving on up. You just mentioned Eckler. My moving on up is uh, Joshua Kelly. He thoroughly outtouched and outplayed uh, Justin Jackson, who is competing with for the uh, the number two slash uh, big back behind Eckler. Uh, he had about sixty yards, scored a touchdown, and he was the preferred option in the red zone. Uh, that's what kind of shocked me. I thought the that Eckler's versatility would have kept him in uh, close to the close to the red the, the end zone, but uh, Kelly came in. He played well, and it's clear the Chargers coaching staff wants him to wants him to have a big role on the team. So if you need a uh, need a running back that you know could score some touchdowns, could be a flex in good matchups, uh, Joshua Kelly's the guy. Yeah, Joshua Kelly, I uh, he's definitely on the uh, he's definitely on the waiver waiver wire for people. Yeah, I guess he was. I guess he'd be more closer to a. I don't think a spec ad, but I think he's definitely waverable. I mean, if you're not able to get. If you lose, uh, if you lose your waiver uh, on waiver priority because you didn't spend, uh, I think he's, he's going to get added on waivers. I don't think he'll be left there. In, in he won't be left. Days. No, no. Um, if he is anywhere, uh, my guy is Paris Campbell. Um, a load of targets uh, in the slot, and I kind of expected this because Paris Campbell plays in the same kind of position as Keenan Allen. And and the the only problem I had, a little nervous about Paris Campbell because of injury history, and also he had that car accident late last uh, August. There was you know so he was in the concussion protocol, and then, mm, he was because he was he was my guy up until that point, and but you know injury history, but he looked great. 71 yards, and he even uh, did a bit of RPO work by carrying the ball once. So um, he looks good. Um, I think he's a guy that you've got to add. Um, any comments on Paris Campbell, Kev? Yeah, Paris Campbell is uh, kind of like a breakout potential star this season. He was a second-round pick last year, and he just got hurt. And so, you know, in his second year, theoretically, he should do better. So I'm not too surprised to see him involved. All right. And I guess, you know, it's it's a bit too early to panic, but we've got to talk about the panic button because um, we, we should never panic in September, but we do. I mean, there are things that I guess I guess panic button isn't really quite the thing to say early on, but we call this segment panic, the panic button. And uh, but we're going to have to press it for some for some people. Um, Jono, who are you panicking on? In, uh, after we've early won? panic is a. Uh... Uh, Rob Gronkowski. Uh, Gronk, just he didn't look uh, good. I mean, coming off a year off, I wasn't expecting prime Gronk or anything, but uh, it, it still looked like he was moving uh, or trying to move around with some injuries. Uh, it didn't look good, you know, running his routes. He only had uh, two catches for 11 yards. Um, he still looked good blocking. He was still elite uh, run and pass blocking for Brady, which at this point, uh, Bruce Arians might choose to keep it, keep him in that role because uh, he again he didn't look good running the routes. Uh, OJ Howard had six targets. He had a pretty good game, and unless he you know he gets into the uh, he gets in gets back into the rhythm you know after a year off, but as of right now. He's not uh, he's not startable until he shows something in in the stat column. Yeah, OJ Howard couldn't buy a target, and yet he gets six six targets. Couldn't buy a target last year. This year <laughs> comes out, scores a touchdown. Even <sighs> what's to say, John? Uh, Kev, uh, anything to add to about? Uh, uh, are you panicking on Gronk? Probably not. Yeah, cause... I mean. I'm not panicking only because I was never high on him. Like, I just didn't think like, yeah, I get it. He was familiar with Brady and yeah, I get it. He's the all time, like the best tight end of all time in my eyes, but coming off a season or coming off taking one season off and then joining a stacked offense with just a ton of different options. I just never was really high on him. 
No. Um, I guess I'll do mine uh, next, and my panic guy is Mark Ingram, and we talked about uh, J.K. Dobbins, and I think it isn't looking good for Mark Ingram. Um, of course, it's early doors. I mean, it's uh, we're not uh, we're, we're <coughs> but I, I don't think you're dropping Mark Ingram or anything like that. But on the other thing, on the other hand, I think you kind of have to bench Mark Ingram for the time being. You can't put him in your flex. So um, until you find out for sure, but he's um, he's on uh, the fantasy roster bubble right now, and uh, I feel nervous about Mark Ingram. Kev, um, I'm nervous, <coughs> sure, but I think for the time being, he's he's still startable. I mean, he's a good bet to get a touchdown in that Ravens offense. So uh, I think you just throw him out there, and then I'm kind of thinking the opposite, like until. Dobbins shows that he really is taking over the backfield. I still think Ingram is the guy that they trust there in the goal line and when games are actually close. Right. Well, what about you, uh, John? Uh, is he uh, is he a bubble candidate? I mean, he's not the drop or anything. Uh, the confidence no. level in your starting him goes down, but I'm going to trust the Ravens fan on this one. It's, you, you start Ingram until Dobbins shows that, he, uh, that he's the guy. Kev, you're up. Who are you panicking on? Uh, so my panic button is on Cooper Cup. Um, four tar, uh, caught four out of five targets for 50, 40 yards. But the biggest problem is the target share. Uh, Goff threw the ball 31 times, uh, through to Robert Woods eight. That solidified he's the wide receiver one right there. Then he spread it out a lot between Higby, Cup, Van Jefferson, and Malcolm Brown. So that's what's worrying me. Um, Cup is just a guy who's because he's not really a big play guy. He does need to get a large volume of targets, and I didn't think uh, this game kind of really showed me that he's a priority in their offense. Yeah, I. You, if I was a <laughs> cup owner, I'd be very, very nervous. You know what? It threw me off. I didn't know he changed his number from 18 to 10. I thought, who's this 10 guy? I didn't even know. I didn't know he changed his number from 18 to 10. Did you guys know about that? I didn't know. Do you know why he did that? No. Why did he do that? I'm Googling it right now. He just, oh, he said it wasn't available when he was drafted in 2017 as it was worn by Pharaoh Cooper at the time. So he just always wanted 10, I guess. Okay. All right. Yeah, he wore 10 in college. Yeah, it's kind of like John Ross. He wanted to change his number two. He wanted to be number 11. Now he is. So I think I think John Ross started off as number 15. So he didn't like 15. He wanted to be 11, just like Julio. Anyway, um, it's time for... Mr. Unlimited. Gotta be unlimited. And, well, as luck would have it, um, and I think it's quite deserving, Russell Wilson is the Mr. Unlimited. 31.78 fantasy points uh, in in standard scoring. Uh, did great. Uh, all around, uh, I think he, uh, 34 attempts and he, 31 usual Russell uh, efficiency. Um a great solid game by Russell Wilson. He, I think he felt a little snubbed by, because Lamar just, um, just went into another gear and just overtook, uh, Russell Wilson for the MVP last year. So I think Russell Wilson really wants to get after it this year. And, uh, I hope he does. I like Russell. So, uh, Kev, Russell, um, he shows some, show some muscle. Yeah, Mr. Unlimited. He um, is. Yeah, I mean, he talked in the he talked in the preseason in interviews about how he wanted to kind of run a more Patrick Mahomes esque offense where he just kind of opens it up a little bit more. And Pete Carroll didn't necessarily say no, and it kind of looks like they're going to give him the opportunity to do that. Um, not as many rushing attempts, definitely more passing attempts in this game. Although some of it might have to do with the fact that the Falcons defense is just horrible. But um, if we see more of this from Russ, like I could, yeah, I could definitely see an MVP season coming from him. Yeah, uh, John. Oh, some other candidates for uh, for Mister Unlimited this week uh, were Josh Jacobs, um, Devontae Adams, uh, Mark Andrews. Um, all all worthy of the of the title. Yeah, I mean Jacobs, like we discussed earlier, Jacobs just you know established himself as the guy. All the passing the passing down stuff is uh you know a thing of the past. And if 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 you know if it wasn't the Mister Unlimited award and uh, it wasn't Russ's to begin with, I think uh, Jacobs would have been the guy if Russ didn't have such a great game. Yeah, the the Mister Unlimited award it does have uh, Russell's face on it, and I think it's fair. And and he earned it on his first in in week one. It's not like we're just giving it to him because uh, because he is Mister Unlimited and he coined the phrase. Uh, it, he did earn it, so um, I thought it was fair that Russell gets our gets the inaugural uh, Mister Unlimited. So there we are, our Mr. Unlimited. Uh, any other uh, 
uh, you know, some other some other candidates for that uh, I thought were great was uh, is Calvin Ridley as well. You know, they had a lot of great. Uh, uh, Robbie Anderson surprised us. Uh, so uh, I just want to talk about Robbie Anderson for a second. Are we uh, if he if he's unowned, do we get him, Kev? Uh, I I be- I guess based off speculation, you kind of have to. I mean, the majority of his production came on a seventy-five yard touchdown where there was a blown coverage and a missed tackle. But he did have eight targets, six catches on eight targets. So um, there's a possibility. I mean, I'm never against speculation ads. So yep. uh, if he's out there, why not? Oh, if you got someone to drop. Um, yep. But that brings up our uh, waiver wire. There are lots of uh, lots of waivers to talk about. Um, uh, I don't know if you guys take your pick. I got I got the list up here of waiver running backs. We were you can see the list up there. Uh, take your pick of anybody that you'd like to uh, of of that that are decent. It doesn't have to be the top waiver pick, but uh, Jono, uh, take a pick of the of a of a waiver guy that you're kind of looking at. That, uh, uh, sure, I'll go. Uh, I'll just go with the veteran. I'll go Adrian Peterson. Uh, walked into the Lions locker room uh, with like a week's notice and rushed what 18 times. He had a big game, like 90 yards. Uh, and Kerry and Johnson, and DeAndre Swift combined had fewer carries than uh, than Peterson. And of course, DeAndre Swift didn't help his uh didn't help his stock by dropping what would have been the winning touchdown uh, in the end zone. Just a uh, brutal game for the for the young backs all around. And uh, Adrian Peterson. Definitely looks to be the guy that's going to grab the lion's share of the carries in Detroit. Yeah, I don't know. Was that the biggest Bears comeback in history from uh, from being down that far in the fourth quarter? So I think that hurts. The something. funniest. <laughs> it was. Ridiculous. It's definitely the funniest. It's ridiculous. Like I mean, I mean, we're kind of uh, used. I mean, to, the, the Lions get burned in the fourth quarter. Like, you used to uh, Aaron Rodgers burning like he, he burned Detroit like on a hail mary. And then, and then, the, then the Bears, uh, you know, make this uh, make this massive uh, rally to come back and win the game. <laughs> and like late in the fourth, I mean, this wasn't just this wasn't just like early in the fourth fourth quarter. I mean, they were they had to. I just don't know. It's just like a total collapse, a total joke. The Matt Patricia team, it's just yeah. But you're right about uh, Adrian Peterson. I just want to point that out. Yeah, Adrian Peterson definitely uh, worthy of the the pickup. There's so many. Um, I'm going to take Peyton Barber. You know, I made a mistake. Uh, Bryce Love was, and I have to say that. Uh, well, it's it's my fault for taking Joe Bond's advice because because <laughs> Joe Bond kind of was promoting Bryce Love. Because I mean, I got to take Joe Bond because I mean he's 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 the he's our leader. He's our uh, he's the leader of the of the pack, as say, as we say. And also, he's uh, a fan of the the Washington Football Team, formerly known as another name. Uh, but Peyton Barber came out, and and it looks like it's going to be uh, a Peyton Barber S Z N, right? Uh, is that is that, where, is that how it goes, Kev? Correct. Peyton, season. Season. Is it Peyton Barber season? Just season. It is not Peyton Barber season. We do not care about. <laughs> We do not care about Washington running backs on the fantasy edge. <laughs> not really, not really. But you got to admit, Bryce Love is a bust. Oh yeah, of course. I mean, he was again. We don't care about. Why, why are we even talking about this? We Did, didn't somebody, in, 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 especially the third guy on the depth chart? <laughs> well, yeah, uh, but didn't. You, didn't somebody spend sixty five bucks on on Bryce Love? No, oh, I. They did that in. Uh, yeah, they did Scott that in Fish. my Scott Fishbowl league, and <laughs> I wouldn't recommend doing that this week. No, no, <laughs> not for Peyton Barber though. No, I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't, wouldn't spend do it for I, any Washington running back. Why? Why? Why would somebody spend sixty five bucks on Bryce Love? I just don't. I just doesn't make sense. <laughs> I spent. I feel bad about spending six bucks. No. Hey, man. I just let people run their teams however they want to run them, and then I'll just sit back and reap the benefits. Yeah. Have you got a uh, anybody? Okay. Uh, have you got a have you got a waiver running back, Kev? I think you're sure. Uh, yeah. I don't know how you knew it was going to be a running back, but well, we're, we're, we're uh, I didn't know which, um, where we were going to start, but Jono started with running back, so I thought we'd do the running back waiver. Are we first. doing each position? All right. Sure, well, my sure. running back would be Malcolm Brown. I I don't know. He probably is owned in more than 40% of leagues, I would guess. But in those 40% of leagues, you got to go out and get them. I, I think the Rams running back position is one of the most valuable positions to own in fantasy football. Right. And it looks like he's going to be the starter there. So 
as long as he's going to be the starter um, and he's going to handle the majority of the touches, then like you, you saw, the upside is there because Sean McVay is a genius. And um, yeah, just go out and get Malcolm Brown. I think he's the priority. He'd be priority priority for me over Hines and Peterson. Mm. Yeah, uh of course, naturally, uh, what, yeah, yeah, he's got a, he should be priority over Heinz. Uh, Heinz, uh, Dobbins, uh, as, as John will mention, Kelly, just some of the other names I'm just throwing out there. Chase Edmonds, uh, another name, uh, you'll be looking to pick up. Uh, Jarek McKinnon, an interesting, uh, an interesting pick. He still looks good. I kind of thought time would pass him by, but apparently not. Uh, Josh Adams, as we mentioned. Uh, I just want to, how about, uh, Miles Gaskin, John O? <laughs> Uh, I like, mean, that was a weird one. Everyone was debating all week about Jordan Howard versus Matt Breda, and then Gaskin gets uh, the majority of the snaps and the, and the touches. Maybe it was just uh, something to throw off the Pats' defense, but Gaskin didn't look bad. I'm not going to say he looked better than Breda or Howard, but like he didn't look bad. And if uh, Brian Flores wants to give him the touches, then you have to uh, try and follow them if you're desperate at running back and you're an idiot that drafted James Conner and Le'Veon Bell like I was, so... Well, you know. uh, Jordan Howard didn't look that great. I mean, okay, Howard scored a touchdown. Might have saved your fantasy bacon, but, I mean, all in all, it just didn't look... And Bredo was nowhere, yeah, you know, so... But Gaskin, uh, I don't know. Um, but anyways, and to round out our waiver running backs is Carlos Hyde. It was uh, another guy that you can be looking... Okay, uh, John, uh, pick, a, pick a waiver wide receiver we can focus a little bit extra time on. Uh, I'll try to go with one we haven't really, uh, we haven't talked about. I'll go Russell Gage. Uh, um, 100 Falcons. yards. Yeah, big game. Uh, I believe it was 12 targets uh, over 100 yards. Uh, he's done, he did this a couple times last year as well, and then he got hurt. But uh, the Falcons look like they're going to be uh, a throwing team. Uh, of course, with Matt Ryan there, they're behind, but uh, they will be a pass first team, of course. Uh, Todd Gurley is not a huge threat uh, in the running game. He was last among qualified running backs in yards ru- yards per route uh, last year on the backfield, and he had five catches for one yard on Sunday. So he's not exactly a threat to take a ton of uh, a ton of yards and a ton of moving there. So I think uh, as the number three receiver, uh, Gage is a is a good option if you're in a deeper league or you need a uh, a flex in case of injury or something. All right. Um, uh, yeah, I, I thought that Russell Gage, and you know, three Ridley, Julio, and Gage all went over. I don't know how. I don't know how many times that has happened in history, where in one game three receivers go over 100 yards. I'll have to check. I'll have to check the. Uh, I'll have to do a search in uh, Fantasy Pro Pro uh, uh, Pro Football Reference and do a search to see um, how many times that has happened. I don't think it's. I think it must be pretty rare, Kev. Probably. Uh, I can't think of too many threesomes of wide receivers who have been that good. Maybe the Packers probably did it with uh, Cobb, Nelson, and James Jones. Possible, possible. Um, speaking of that, you're up, Kev. Uh, a waiver wide receiver here that you're uh, going to sure. get. Uh, Russell Gage was actually going to be my pick. Uh, since they traded Mohamed Sanu, he's averaged 7.8 targets per game. But uh, outside of him, let's see, we can go with, uh, I mean, uh, no one really wants to, but how about Sammy Watkins? I mean, seven of nine targets, 82 yards and a touchdown. I get it. He did this last season. I remember last season people had him ranked as like wide receiver five after week one. Um, but you just can't ignore it. You can't ignore his usage in the in this passing game. You can't ignore the fact that Miko Hardman is clearly behind him. I think Sammy Watkins is if people are going to leave him on the waiver wire because of what happened last year, uh, I think you kind of have to take advantage. Uh, are you willing to scoop, uh, John? Sammy Watkins? You gonna put in a claim? Uh, yeah. If I if I need a running back, you can you can uh, you have to follow Watkins. Uh, I know he was a little inconsistent last year. Of course, he had the big week one and then really tailed off later on. But this is an offense you want a piece of, and you know it, as long as you're not spending thirty dollars, forty dollars of your of your budget, and you're adding Sammy Watkins, it can't hurt to have somebody with that much upside in that in that offense. No, I am going. Yeah, and that's right. And you, uh, the the key point there, of course, is the offense, which is the Kansas City Chiefs, and he uh, he looked good. But then again, he looked good in Week One last year, and then following up with practically nothing, from, which. Which kind of destroys a lot of people because you end up holding and holding a guy and waiting for him to go off again. But I don't know. Uh, my guy's going to be Marquez Valdez Scantling. Uh, really, um, a, a, an outside choice for the for the Packers. But um, 
And there was a bit of, well, not coach speak so much as quarterback speak about him, um, that Rodgers was uh, um, quietly, he was quietly impressing um, Rodgers throughout uh, training camp. And uh, it showed on the field. He's uh, He's got a lot more confidence in MVS right now. So um, I think Lazard is still the uh, number two there, but uh, Marquez Val- Valdez-Scantling should be on uh, uh, your waiver list of, uh, of, of guys to pick up this week. Um, so, uh, I don't know if you're any comments, but he's definitely getting targets and he's getting looks. He's getting good looks as well. So, um, it seems to be what Rogers is saying is being proven on the field. Uh, Kev, uh, or Kev, I'll start with you if you want to add anything to Marquez Valdez Scantling. Yeah, not, not much to add. I mean, it's just if Rogers is back to being Aaron Rodgers, then yeah, the wide receiver two, the wide receiver three, there are going to have some value. Right. And uh, just to round out the other waiver wires, just quickly go with a lot of these guys we've talked about. It's, of course, uh, Robbie Anderson. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Willie Sneed. Uh, not too keen on Sneed. Though he 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 was involved, but I don't think he's uh, I don't think he's that important uh, to uh, a priority for you. Uh, Keelan Cole again, similar uh, similar to Snead, very similar. Um, not not a priority get. I'm gonna I'm gonna omit the next guy, Paris Campbell. We mentioned, and I'll omit the last guy because we're going to be talking about those those other players later. But uh, waiver tight ends, I will start with Dallas Goddard. Um. There's been talk about Zach Ertz. Um, probably this may be his last year with the Eagles, and I think they're phasing towards Dallas Goddard. And I, if you, if Dallas Goddard is out there, you should try to pick him up. I'm sure he's probably drafted in a lot of 12-team leagues that have uh, reasonable depth. And um, so, if if Dallas Goddard is out there, I think I think that's. I think there's definitely a shift going on. You you could sort of feel it in 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 the game as a, in the game flow that Dallas Goddard was definitely more the uh, more the target more the guy to target more so than what we've seen in the past between Wentz and and Ertz. It was gone. It it's sort of the shift is the sh- a shift is in the works. I'm pretty sure. I, I just just going by eye test here. Um, Jono, what do you think, Dallas Goddard? Yeah, I mean Goddard. Last year, he played very well at the end of the at the end of the year. He was a top, you know, a, a tight end one, uh, very startable for the last second half of the season, and he's just continually more of the same. Uh, had a huge game uh, when the Eagles were leading, and they don't face particularly strong defenses the next couple of weeks either. So I could see Goddard being a top ten tight end for the next for the next few weeks at least, if not the rest of the season, provided that, uh, as you said, there isn't actually hasn't been a you know a changing of the guard there, and Goddard takes over the the targets. Mm. Uh, Kev, anything to add? And then uh, you can move on to your uh, tight end. Yeah, Goddard is good at football. That's not a surprise. Uh, with w- no bad receivers on that team, he should see a lot of targets. Um, the only question, it's just surprising that he was so much more effective with them than Ertz was. Uh, my tight end waiver would be Logan Thomas. Um, I mean, four, he caught four of eight targets for 37 yards and a touchdown. That Washington passing attack, if we can even call it that, doesn't have many options. So I'm willing to, you know, I guess take it out on a flyer. He's a super athletic big dude. So uh, those are kind of what we want in tight ends. And uh, you got, you, again, you might as well. Yeah, yeah that's he's, – he's not he's not a high one for me. I'd much more uh, – I'd much more go with somebody different on a better team because this is week one and it could be just – you know, that could have been just a, an aberration. But – it doesn't harm. It doesn't harm me to pick him up on a. I guess he's he's kind of. I guess he kind of more or less goes in the spec ad department, really, for me. Yep. Uh, Jono, uh, if you want to add to that, and then give us your tight end. Uh, yeah. I mean, I like I like Thomas. I have him in my waiver or, waiver wire article for this week uh, as one of my my tight end ads. Uh, he had eight targets. Had a good game. And maybe Haskins likes the guy. Who knows? Uh, my tight end ad for the week is the exact opposite of Logan Thomas. I'm going Jimmy Graham, the uh, the oldest guy on our list here. I think is he older than Greg Olson? Maybe not. Definitely but not. the I'm most broken close. down one on the list. No, nope. Greg Olson's probably still more broken down than him. The most accomplished. Uh, Graham for the Bears. He has that. He had uh, seven targets last week, three receptions, 25 yards, and a touchdown. 
Uh, there is a three-way tight end split in Chicago with uh, with Cole Komet and shoot, I forgot the other guy's name. Uh, Shaheen is he still there? I don't think it's Shaheen. Shoot, I forgot. But uh, anyway, anyways, Graham had uh, he played thirty-five snaps and he ran a pass, he ran a route on thirty-one of them. Uh, Jimmy Graham doesn't go on the field to block. If he's on the field, he's running a route. And if you're the Bears and they, you have a uh, a big target like Jimmy Graham to help out Mitch Trubisky, then you're going to use him, especially if you gave him uh, so much guaranteed money uh, for, for two years. He's going to get used, and he's going to be a good red zone target for them. Uh, maybe a little inconsistent just in terms of catches and maybe the yardage because the Bears' offense isn't the most high-powered, but if you're betting on any tight end getting a touchdown uh, outside of maybe, Mark, of, of obviously, Mark Andrews, then Jimmy Graham is the guy. Yeah, you know, when he went to Seattle and uh, later on to the Packers, I really didn't see that um, uh, where he w- that effectiveness that we saw w- in his early years with, with the Saints. And it seems to me that, that Graham, in that, at least in week one, um, I was watching a, a, a Graham that was kind of like looking like the Jimmy Graham, more like the Jimmy Graham before, maybe, maybe a little bit like the Graham of, of Seattle. But um, there were shades of that Saints type of Jimmy Graham. The, and, uh, he looked good. He looked good. Uh, he looked fresh. Um, he looks like he's happy being with the Bears. So, and uh, it was a very good, uh, a very good outing for Graham. Caught a touchdown, of course. Uh, was involved, but uh, once, but I was watching he, when, whenever I was watching Red Zone. But anytime the uh, Bears offense was on the field, I was, I was kind of watching. Uh, I, I was sort of keying my eyes a little bit on on Graham to see how he would do. So yeah, uh, yeah, Jimmy Graham. Uh, Kev, you got anything to add about Jimmy Graham? Uh, not really. Um, nope. That's All right. It. All right. Uh, just some other uh, waiver t- uh, uh, tight ends that you might want to uh, put on your list if they are available in your leagues is uh, T.J. Hawkinson, uh, O.J. Howard, of course, who we mentioned, Jordan Aikens, who scored a touchdown in the Thursday night game, and Greg Olson, who. Uh, actually looks like a good fit in Seattle, which uh, kind of surprised me because I kind of thought Will Disley, well, Will, Will Disley was mixed in, but uh, it seems like Greg Olson is uh, is definitely, um, I mean, he caught he caught a couple of uh, key first downs in that, uh, in that game. And uh, it looks like Russell is trusting him to, as his uh, outlet guy for, for uh, getting the first down. So that looks pretty good. Um, who should we start with? We'll start with uh, Kev for quarterbacks. I only have three on the list. I don't know if uh, if you guys want to go off this list. I, I could only think of three that it, that made any sense that that you might want to get if you're if you're uh, if if Wentz isn't warmed up enough for you or you or you just don't like other quarterback that you that you got. Uh, Kev, who would you like to? Uh, if you need a quarterback yeah. and you didn't. I mean, the one guy I'd be willing to consider is Minshew. I just think everything that we kind of thought about him going to the season is is pretty much true. Like their team is going to be horrible. I know they beat the Colts, but they were playing from behind the whole time. And that's what we want from Minshew. Um, yeah, he's through for 173 yards and three touchdowns is ultra accurate. He has a decent amount of weapons around him. So I think he's a good pickup pretty much. I wouldn't say every week, but if the matchup is soft enough or the other team is good enough, like he might be worth it. Hmm. Uh, Jono, did you uh, join a public league and draft <laughs> Gardner Minshew in the first round? No, unfortunately, that only qualifies for uh, the U.S. Canadian residents do not qualify for that. So uh, unfortunately, I do not get a free case of beer. All uh, right. What about you, Kev? Did, you didn't. You didn't no, I didn't. I don't, I don't drink beer anymore. So. Uh, okay. Fair enough. I uh, know I didn't. I guess. Uh, I guess there's no point. But uh, Gardner Minshew, yes, uh, look good. I mean, he's just. <laughs> Won the game for the for the uh, for the Jaguars. Good for them. Um, I'm gonna take uh, I'm gonna take Teddy Bridgewater. Um, Teddy Bridgewater uh, really uh, works in the offense. The only problem with Teddy Bridgewater is I think uh, he might be hurting the value of uh, of DJ. I think. And that's not good for people. I think because he's not. I, I don't think there's there's that real connect with uh, with with DJ yet. So uh, it's it just not looking good. But other than that, as a quarterback, I mean, he's solid enough. Um, when you have uh, when you're throwing the ball to uh, Christian McCaffrey, you're going to get those. You're going to get good cheap uh, yards after the catch uh, to your passing stats. And um, Teddy Teddy Bridgewater. Uh, Definitely, uh, you can do worse. I think he's matchup based, but 
Um, I think he's a guy you can pick up. Uh, Kev, I'll let you start with the, your thoughts on P- Teddy. Oh, I mean, same thing. Yeah, he didn't have a connection with DJ Moore, but uh, I assume that's going to come. I still targeted him nine times, so it's not all not all is not lost for DJ Moore. That's why I didn't have him in my panic section. But uh, the Panthers are, are kind of similar to the Jaguars. Like, their defense is horrible, and uh, they have enough weapons where Bridgewater is going to be able to put up some numbers here and there. Mm. And, uh, Jono, uh, your t- thoughts on Teddy Bridgewater, and you can talk about your next guy. Yeah, I mean, like you guys said, there's the chance that Bridgewater can be a serviceable guy, but there's nothing nothing new I can add <laughs> for, for Teddy Bridgewater, just that the defense is going to be bad, and he's going to have to throw it at some point. Right, Jono, though, you need a quarterback. Your, your, your other quarterback sucked, so you want to get a different one. If I need a new one? Yeah, if you need a new one. Uh, I'm going to go off our list here and go with Philip Rivers. Uh, oh, okay. Well, Brady's 97% old in Yahoo, so can't go uh, with Tom Brady. All right. Oh, is he 95%? I just yet didn't know. 97% owned in Yahoo. Can't exactly pick up Tom Brady. No. Uh, Rivers is 27% owned in Yahoo. Uh, as I mentioned at the top when talking about Jonathan Taylor and the injury to Marlon Mack, uh, apparently the the uh, Colts offense has gone to a pass-heavy offense. Um Despite, you know, they had the lead in the first half and Rivers still managed to throw 46 passes uh, against the Jaguars, uh, 363 yards and a touchdown. Uh, Classic Rivers, again, he threw a couple of interceptions, but if he's going to be throwing this often, then I don't see why he can't be a serviceable uh, starting QB if you if somebody got hurt or, you know, one of your other guys has a bad matchup or something. Um <laughs> It, it, even if he's not throwing it downfield, he's going to have a ton of a ton of attempts to Hines and Jonathan Taylor, and a uh, decent floor option if you if you need a uh, if you need a backup there. Yeah, he's uh, he's definitely uh, he's back in the stream conversation. His his last year in uh, San Diego, not San Diego, Los Angeles, uh, wasn't very good. But it looks like he's uh, found a bit firmer footing. It seems like in Indianapolis. Um, I guess it's time to talk about who. Well, if we're going to be picking up guys, we've got to drop some people. And I've already mentioned this guy, Bryce Love. I picked him up. Uh, my bad. Well, I'm. You know what? I'm going to blame Joe Bond because he hyped him up. <laughs> so I, I hate to. I hate to blame our fearless leader, but he kind of hyped him up. I thought, you know what? I I rarely take Joe's advice, so I thought, well. Why don't I take Joe's advice and, well, of course, you know, I'll take Bryce Love. And I, and I thought, it, and it made sense, but he was a healthy scratch, which kind of sucked. Um, there was other, other guys were healthy scratches too in the, in the league that you thought that would, would start. But uh, Bryce Love, uh, yeah, if you picked him up on the anticipation of getting some workload in that backfield, such as this, um, yeah, d- yeah, don't, dump your Bryce Love shares with the, and, and clear your conscience. And a spot for uh, for a new waiver guy. So, um, uh, Kev, uh, who are you? Who do we got to drop? Who are you going to drop? Uh, we're dropping Carry On Johnson. Um, this might be a bit premature, but I I tend to, to be like that. Uh, that don't make any jokes, Jonathan. Um, it's just a three headed backfield, and it seems like he's the odd man out. Uh, I know DeAndre Swift had the drop, but I just don't think he's going to lose that role to Carry On Johnson. I think. I'm not going to hang on to him for another two to three weeks just to see how things pan out. I'm just done with him, and I'm just going to drop him. Yeah, I think it's worth it, especially with the rise of Adrian Peterson. It just seems like he's just, you know, loose change. John, wouldn't you say? Yeah. Um, if you're trying to decide between, you know, the three-man rotation between the new rookie and the dude that just ran for 90 yards, it, Karen Johnson is the drop there. Yeah. So who you got then? Who are you going to drop to make room? I am dropping Baker Mayfield. Uh Maybe we thought maybe with the new coach, you know, that wasn't Freddie Kitchens, he'd play well, but the Ravens absolutely just mauled him 21 of 39 for 189 yards. Uh, bad pick. The Browns offense looked terrible, except for Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt, who were efficient, but just. Yeah, there's a lot of wasted talent in that in that Browns receiving core, and Mayfield is not somebody you can trust right now. Hmm. Yeah, you know, I I I was never high from him through. The, I would never draft Baker Mayfield. Uh, he's he was never going to be. Uh, he would never be on my team in any capacity. Not even as a uh, not even as a bench stash or anything. Uh, I don't know how you feel, Kev, but Baker Mayfield, he was never going to be. Uh, maybe you feel differently. I mean, I wasn't high on him this year, but uh, at the same time, like you gotta, you gotta give him a bit of a pass. This Ravens defense just—they're 
the Ravens are pretty good at defense. They put him in a bad spot. Um, he did make some ridiculously bad throws, but um, like he missed OBJ. OBJ should have had like a hundred yard game. Right? Yeah, he was a panic button actually for some people. Um, he would be, except that you know OBJ had Marlon Humphrey on him all game, and like I said, um, Mayfield was. There's a there's a compilation on Twitter that I saw. Mayfield was just missing him all day. Uh, there was one really bad drop that everyone remembers, but Mayfield was was just super inaccurate all game. So I wouldn't really blame him. Um, I wouldn't blame OBJ too much. Uh, that being said, like back to Mayfield, he'll he'll have better days. But yeah, I, I agree. He's probably a drop. He's probably just at best a quarterback streamer. All right. Uh, and, uh, well, we're doing good on time. We haven't even, uh, perfect. Good. Um, we've got time for our spec ads and, uh, spec ads, uh, just to explain what spec ads are. Spec ads are guys who are a little bit around the curve, but are not quite guys that you're rushing out to get. It's, they're kind of like after waivers are done, you can sort of consider if you didn't get who you wanted in, in your, uh, or if there's somebody else you want to drop. They're kind of like afterthought um pickups that you know may do something and uh i will start with my guy quintus cephas who got 10 targets uh, he was actually in there to replace um kenny galladay who was out with a hamstring now we don't know about status uh does anybody know the hand the status of kenny galladay is he going to be ready for next week or uh i think it's still up in the air typically reports don't really come out over the weekend yeah so it makes quintus cephas a bit of a he's a rookie um, I think sixth round or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> Anyways, he's, really, he's a deep, deep round rookie, but he still got targeted 10 times. He got three catches out of it, but I'm sure that, I mean, if you're going to get tar- targeted, to, he will get better. I mean, he is a rookie. So Quintez Cephas is a guy, um, uh, you might want to, uh, you might want to spec on. So I don't know. It kind of surprised me, Cephas. Uh, I don't know how you guys feel about Cephas as a spec, a spec at. Have you heard his name before? Obviously. Uh, okay. uh, I, I heard a little bit about him in the off season, a uh, rookie fifth rounder, but it was um, a fifth rounder, right? Okay. I knew he was, yeah, deep. 10 targets, three catches, 43 yards, uh, speculation, put him on the list, put him on the spec list. Don't rush to pick him out. Yeah. And, uh, well, uh, leave it up to you, Kev, for your spec. Sure. Uh, my spec is another rookie, LaVisca Chenault. Um, I just kind of liked what I saw from him. Um, just, uh, four tar- caught three or four targets for 37 yards and a touchdown, had two rushing attempts. Um, four targets doesn't seem like much, but that's actually a fifth of all of Minshew's targets. Um, seems like he's kind of working into this weird rotation of DJ Chark, him, uh, Chris Conley, and, uh, G. Westbrook. It's, it's kind of a lot of people in that backfield, but I think Chenault kind of brings a little bit, something a little bit different than those other guys. Uh, I just kind of like, I don't know, I'm high on the Jaguars offense for no reason in particular, I guess, besides <laughs> Minshew. Well, um, I will say this, LaVisca Chenault is, is um, like you say, Westbrook has uh, definitely uh, fallen off the fantasy radar. And LaVisca, somebody asked, do you think, uh, just just a question though, will LaVisca Chenault, do you think he'll get into, I mean, he's not in sleeper status and neither, neither is Quintus Cephas. These guys aren't in sleeper status yet, but uh, do you think his chances of getting into sleeper status are pretty good? Or um, I think so. I think, um, again, I think with the Jaguars offense, there is some opportunity there. And I think with the type of player that Chenault is, I think as the season goes on, they'll find more and more uses for him they'll find more and more uh, ways to utilize him best and uh, if they put him in a position to succeed i think he's talented enough to do some stuff oh. and john oh, you can add to that and then give us your uh spec ad of the guy around the curve uh yeah i mean chanel played well uh had him as one of the the options on the waiver wire piece and like kevin said the jags offense looked very good uh, better than they should have, or better than people thought they were going to look like against uh, against a, a good Colts defense. So if they have some, you know, some more time to play together, then I think Shino can establish himself as the uh, well number two behind Shark if if thing if thing goes well for him. Mm-hmm. And uh, my guy for this week, uh, Kevin, this is not a joke. It's not a drill. Uh, Scotty Miller uh, with the Bucks. Mm. It's not a joke whatsoever. He's uh, he played well in uh, in the loss yesterday to the Saints. He caught five passes for 73 yards. Uh, probably just because Mike Evans was shut down by Marshawn Lattimore uh, and with his his injury. But if uh, if Evans can't play next week or they choose to hold him out uh, next week due to his hamstring injury, then Scotty Miller might be the number two target behind Chris Godwin. 
Uh, Brady talked about him, uh, talked about him all through camp. There was a lot of hype about the, the small slot guy, the speedy slot guy, and uh, it, it panned out in week one. We don't know what's going to look like next week because Brady tends to spread the ball around, but he's got some qualities that uh, previous Brady receivers have, and uh, it could go well for him. I think you might be right. You know something? He had that look of, uh, you know, those guys like Cole Beasley, uh, Danny Amendola, um, Adam Humphreys. You know, he, he's kind of like one of those guys, Jono. Yeah, just a lunch pail guy. First lunch in, lap out. Guy. Yeah. Right. First in, left out. Hardest working guy on the field. Yeah, so I think, I think Jono, you might be onto something with that guy. I think you might be onto something with that guy. I wonder if, I wonder if he's in our in our uh, F6P league. I might target that, that dude. <laughs> or he might be gone. No, Joe will grab him. Oh, La- <laughs> figures. Lepresto got him. <laughs> Lepresto got him. I won't get him. Okay. Yeah, Lepresto actually added him before the, this week's games, which... Jerk. Uh, just great move. Great move. Really good move. Damn. 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 Well, that about wraps it up for our show. And guess what, guys? We did it right on 60 minutes on the dot. Do you believe it? It's just nice. Just, just a little past 60 minutes. Five. Oh, just a bit past 65. Maybe. Um, next week, uh, Jono will host the show, and I get to sit back and uh, and uh, Jono, I'll make sure all the sheets are all filled out and everything, so it's to help you along. And, uh, but that's our show, and uh, we'll hope to see you uh, a week two. Good luck on your waiver pickups. We want to thank uh, Jonathan Chan and Kevin Huo, uh, my co-hosts, for, the, for putting in their valuable input for, uh, for your fantasy teams. We'll see you next week on the Fantasy Edge. I'm Richard Seville. Take care, everybody.